Welcome to Northgate Bible Chapel Online. Thanks for checking out our podcast, where you can listen to our latest sermons, filled with teaching, encouragement, and hope from God's Word. So whether you're outdoors, in the car, or just poured some coffee, let's dive in to today's message. you could turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. So if you are visiting this morning, we've been working through the book of Romans as a series for um, going back to last year. And, um, and so we find ourselves in chapter 9 this morning and Uh, It's really a fitting topic, uh, given all that's going on with Israel right now. Uh, Something just to think about is, is Israel still part of God's plans? And um, and we won't be able to dive in great detail into answering that specific question, but that is some of, um, we get a glimpse into that in our passage this morning, and I've titled it, What About Israel? Um, And... Let's just open once again in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to to submit ourselves to your word. Lord, we desire to be taught by you this morning. Uh, You are our teacher. You are our master, our Lord. And so we desire to hear your thoughts. Um, We desire to um, to understand more what your plan is through the ages. And ultimately, Father, we we long to know um, and to be in conformity to your will and into your plan of salvation for each of us. And so we look to you for for strength, for help, understanding some um, some difficult passages. Lord, we just uh, look to you for your grace and enabling. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name, amen. So I wanted to briefly, I've, uh, I'm concerned about doing this because I know we have a lot to cover today, but um, I really think it's helpful to refresh our minds that Paul has been addressing Jews all along through the book of Romans. Um, he has a, a very Jewish audience. It was a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles, but there was definitely, um, as we see through it, I think it helps us um, to understand our passage this morning to see how much he has been addressing Israelites and Jews throughout this book. And so I'm just going to read through these without comment and, um, and just move through them kind of quickly. Um, so here, chapter 1 of Romans, 1 through 4, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David. That would be significant to the Jews. Descended from David according to the flesh, verse 4, was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Chapter 2, verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. Romans 3, 1 to 4. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? 
much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. We're going to see that come up in our passage, something similar. Verse 3, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. Chapter 3, verse 9, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been made, or made known, manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. So here we see mention of the law, the prophets, terms the Jews were very familiar with. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Verse 16, Abraham, who is father of us all. And then there are so many references that this is just an excerpt, actually. This isn't exhaustive by any means, but um, chapter 7, verse 1, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law. To reference to Jews, I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Verse 4, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Challenging words for a Jew. You have died to the law, it is through your link to the body of Christ that you may be able to bear fruit for God, is what he's saying. Verse 6, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, almost to our passage. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but according to the spirit. Chapter, 14 and seven, through, chapter 8, 14 to 17. For all who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also um, be glorified with him. And so if you read Romans from the perspective of a Jew listening to Paul's letter up to this point, I don't think it's a stretch to say uh, they would have had some burning questions in their minds, such as, what were even the elect for? You know, was that all in vain that God elected us? Is the church God's new favorite child? Are you telling me Jewish heritage means nothing to God? And what is all of this about being led by the Spirit of God? Kind of sounds like loosey-goosey compared to a law that says this is what you need to do. So what does that mean? And so Paul is going to be addressing these types of inquiries in chapters 9 through 11. Um, chapter these, this section, uh, it's often called a parenthesis, almost like when you read Romans from a Gentile's perspective, this section seems just like it's just random and it, it's, um, 
like out of nowhere, he, Paul just reverts to this. But my point in walking through those passages is to show that it's very logical that Paul would pause at this point and address his Jewish audience and some specific questions that they would be having. And so in chapters 9 through 11, we see the focus is almost exclusively on Israel and, their, and how they fit into the new covenant. And so Paul looks at the children of God, I believe, really in chronological order, where chapter 9 is largely looking at Israel's past um, in terms of their election. Chapter 10 is focused on their present, focused specifically on their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. And then in chapter 11, Israel's future, uh, focused on their future reception. And so... As we read in our or as we read read our passage today, we need to be careful to let the text stand on its own. Um, careful not to assume that the use of the word election has salvation salvation as its end. Um, we really it's it's hard to read passages without our preconceived ideas um, really influencing when we come across a specific word, and so. But there's so much we could get into to try to do a really thorough study here, and I encourage everyone to be doing that on their own, but unfortunately time doesn't allow that today. Um, if we had the time, we could walk through the Old Testament, and, and something that I have looked at quite a bit is all the uses of the word election through the Old Testament. And, um, and you may conclude, as I have, that election in the Old Testament does not, is not unto salvation, that isn't in view in the Old Testament, that this is an election for eternity with God. But rather, it's an election for specific purposes and privileges, um, dealing with God, unfolding his plans. And so I'd encourage you to do that study and, um, and let me know your thoughts. Further, when we come to the New Testament, if the Old Testament hasn't used the word election in the context of salvation, then the challenge is greater, or the challenge remains to prove that election is referring to salvation, or has salvation in view in the New Testament, when the immediate context may not point to that. And so thinking about any challenging topic, we must also keep in mind that God's word cannot contradict itself. And that's because God cannot deny himself. And so what that means is all of his attributes are always perfectly, simultaneously true. He is always acting in perfect harmony with his character. And so with that introduction, let's get started with our passage for today here in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. We'll read the first three verses which I've titled, Paul's Sorrow for His Brethren, the Israelites. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my <clears throat> brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. <clears throat> Can you and I say that about anyone? That we would be willing to be sentenced to an eternity apart from God in order for others to come into relationship with him. It's hard to imagine the kind of love that Paul had for his brethren, the Jews, the, the concern on his heart that we see in, these, in this verse or in these, past, uh, these few verses here. It's hard to imagine, though, that Paul would feel more strongly for the Jews than God would. Right? So certainly God feels as strongly um, and so again, I'm just having a couple points in here that point to why I think this, isn't, this does not have salvation in view in this particular passage. Um, 
it would be hard to think of God feeling so strongly of emotion, of I long for them to be saved, when he is dictating whether they are saved or not. And likewise, Paul, as his chosen messenger of this book, would he have that feeling, that burden for his brothers, if it wasn't, um, if it was other, all, if it was all under divine control and direction of who is saved? Charles Spurgeon wrote, "I have sometimes felt willing to go to the gates of hell to save a soul." But the Redeemer went further, for he suffered the wrath of God for souls. What would be the result if we felt as Paul did? The result would be likeness to Christ. After that manner he loved. He did become a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 He did enter under the awful shadow of Jehovah's wrath for us. He did what Paul could only imagine doing being a curse for others. And so what is Paul sorrowful about? It's that his brethren had at large rejected Christ as their savior. And so I do believe salvation is in view right here. Not remorse over the political state of Israel, um, but general rejection of the Jews of the Messiah is Paul's um, concern. And so that moves us into our next section, verse 4 to 5, Israel's privileged position and purpose. So Paul goes on to explain who he's talking about. Who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises? Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came? who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. And so he's describing in verse 4 to 5 the purpose and privilege of Israel's election. No other nation could say that list and have it be um, applicable to them. The adoption, the glory, the covenants, that was exclusive to Israel. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 reads, couple passages here, no need to turn, they're on the screen. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Talk about purpose and privilege. Your election, in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Isaiah 43, 20 and 21. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the jackals, the ostriches, because I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people which I formed for myself that they might set forth my praise. A privilege, responsibility, purpose to set forth for Israel, to set forth the praises of God. Israel was a very privileged nation. Um, Their election had many unique blessings attached to it in our passage. We read the adoption. Namely, God chose them. The glory, glory of God displayed before them. When the, um, remember what happened, what people said, or what, um, um, the name slipping me, and the woman said this, when the ark, or no, she named her son this, when the ark was captured by the Philistines, she named her son, I think it was Ichabod, because the naming meant, the glory has departed Israel. The glory, they had glory nobody else had. The covenants, God made several covenants, Abraham, Moses, David. In Jeremiah, the future covenant that we know as the new covenant was mentioned to Israel and their assured place in it. We read earlier in Romans, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The law was given. What a privilege 
to be a people. Often we kind of say, you know, I'm so glad we don't have the law as our, as our, um, our rule book to, for righteousness. Uh, but what a privilege Israel had, a unique privilege to have a manual from God um, of what his preferences were, a guide to del- for their daily living. What his, more than preferences, his righteous requirements. Um, so they had the service to God. Again, what a privilege for the tribe of Levi in particular to be able to serve in his temple. The promises, God's promise Promises of which we will read um, some today, but to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God made very specific promises, um, and to their seeds or descendants. And so as with all biblical promises, these were laid hold of by faith. And then we read the fathers. These are references to Abraham, to Moses, all through the Gospels you read of Jews referring to Are you greater than our father Abraham, our father Moses, um, David? Great men in their nation's history, men whom God had elected and made to be great in order to accomplish specific purposes at specific times. And then it says, of whom Christ came. Oh, the privilege of all privileges. Uh, God sent his Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world through Israel through Jacob's descendants. Clearly, the, that, this, these two verses themselves could be a, a really a whole series of study on, the, on Israel and its, nation, and its history uh, with the Lord. Um, but what we will see in the coming verses, Israel's election does not mean their salvation. Only some within the elect would believe in God's Messiah. And so that leads us to verse um, 6 through 9. And that I've titled, Elected Israel's Rejection of the Messiah is Not a Failure of God's Plan. So Israel's election and subsequent rejection of the Messiah was not a failure of God's plan. Reading in verse 6, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, In other words, God's word, Paul is emphasizing, God's word has not failed. For they were not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. Okay, so verse 6 says, not that the word of God has taken no effect. A lot of privileges and um, promises made that we reviewed in verse 4 to 5, those privileges of Israel. And what of these? Was it a waste? Was it for naught? Did the word of God return to him void? Did his plan fail? And the answer is by no means. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the culmination of everything the law, the prophets pointed to. And so, again, Matthew, this is Matthew 5, 17 to 18, Jesus' words. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the law, this was not a failure that God was remedying. It was the the fulfillment, um, the culmination of what these all pointed to. Even though the church comprised of is of saved Jews and saved Gentiles is God's focal point in the current age. I almost picture Israel in our present day, and even when Paul was writing this, it's almost like God has, if you picture a chef often, they've prepared a certain aspect, they get all these specifics, whether spices in a bowl or something cooked separately, and and then they just set it aside because it's gonna come back into play um, later on in the recipe. 
And I see that as Israel's, um, an, an example of how God is treating Israel. He, he's using them for specific purposes early on, but he's made promises that, that guarantee them um, he's not through with them yet. And so we will see in the coming chapters as we continue through Romans how God's intent is to provoke them to jealousy, um, that they may ultimately turn to him um, in a coming day because his promises to them have not been revoked. And so his word did not return to him void. Verse 6 also says, not all Israel who are of Israel. That's a weird, weird thing to say or hard to understand perhaps quickly. Not all Israel who are of Israel. So Israel received their name as the new name God had given Jacob. And so Jacob was the son of Isaac, Isaac the son of Abraham. And so Abraham, we read the, the promise God made to Abraham that in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Abraham has Isaac and Ishmael we read about in our passage. Isaac, gives, uh, Isaac has Jacob and Esau that we also read about in our passage. So first, um, not all Israel who are of Israel. And so the promised line through which all nations of the earth would be blessed wasn't Abraham specifically, but was um, stemming back to the promise God made to Jacob's father Isaac and his father Abraham. And so the, the blessings to Israel are through Jacob and through Isaac. But it's interesting, not all Israel who are of Israel. And so what I think what we're seeing is Paul saying that spiritual Israel is a subset of physical Israel. Not all Israel are of Israel. And so there's something a little deeper than meets the eye when you, um, that is, uh, I think, implied here. Spiritual Israel is a subset of physical Israel. Remember, the Jew thinks he is a child of God by birth. I'm an Israelite because my parents were Israelites. But the Lord Jesus through the Gospels and Paul and his epistles has been reminding them of something. And we see that, Romans 2. I don't know if I put that in the slide. No. Romans 2, verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward of the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So what I believe Paul is getting at by saying this strange phrase, not all Israel who are of Israel, he is saying that there are some who are just Israel by, uh, by heritage, but they are not Israel in spirit. They have not, um, a true Jew, Paul says, is one that is inward, has the circumcision of the heart. Again, Galatians 3.29, And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So don't miss this important point. Israel as a nation was God's elect. But not all within the nation were saved. And that is not a problem because their election was for God's purposes here on earth, not for salvation. I'm saying that's not a problem in terms of God, um, of them losing their salvation or anything of the sort. It's that the election wasn't for salvation, but rather for God's purpose on earth. And so verse 7, we read, Not all children because descendants of Abraham. In Isaac shall your seed be called. Remember, Isaac was the promised son of God um, to Abraham and Sarah. God said to them, in their old age, you will have a son. And if you don't know the story, Abraham and Sarah wait a while, and then they're like, well, this isn't happening. And so they they decide to take things into their own hands. And um, so Sarah says, take my handmaid and have the son of promise with her, saying, speaking to Abraham. And so they did that. The handmaid has a son, um, but that was not, and that son's name was Ishmael, um, but that was not God's. Um, so we see the child of promise is the son that came after Ishmael. God was true to his word. He gave Sarah 
Um, Sarah gave birth to Isaac. And so we have two children, a son um, of promise in our passage and then a son of the flesh. And is Ishmael referring to us in our efforts trying to, to make things happen and to um, even to fulfill God's word in this case. And so not all children because descendants of Abraham. Ishmael is the father of modern day Arabs. And, um, and so the children of Israel came through the seed of Isaac. Okay, verse eight and nine. Um, the question then, when we get here, is who are the children of God? <clears throat> is it the children of flesh or the children of promise? Can it be both? Just as Isaac represented God's way and the child as the child of promise, and Ishmael represented man's way, he's a child of the flesh. Paul is outlining there are two bases that Jews and really mankind in general approach the Lord in general, um, have sought to approach God. That is through the flesh or God's way. Through the flesh, natural means. Um, by, you know, I was born into this. Some would say, my parents are Catholic. I'm Catholic. I'm good with God. Some would say, I'm a Jew. I was born a Jew. I'm good with God. And so, but that would be of the flesh. I was born into this. Whereas Paul is very clear, this is not a physical birth he's referring to, but a spiritual birth that matters. The, the children of promise are a spiritually born child. And so, um, and so the second way, the child um, of, of promise is one that's received by faith. And that's the tie um, of to God's righteousness and mercy to a sinner is coming through faith. So, so I think you'll agree, Paul is communicating some challenging concepts um, beyond strictly the election of, Is of Isaac, namely what Isaac is a type of and what Ishmael is a type of or an example of. It's Isaac that God's way is shown in or the circumcision of the heart versus the circumcision of the flesh that ultimately makes you a child of God. John 1, verse 11, Jesus put it, um, I think, in a, in a good way because he mentions who the children of God are. He, Jesus, came to his own, Jews, Israelites, and those who were his own did not receive him, meaning they didn't believe in him. They didn't receive him as their redeemer, their savior. Verse 12, but as many as receive him, the idea of receive is to repent and to believe, we read in scripture, as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, born of God. And so to conclude this section, I believe Israel's election is an example of the whosoever wills in scripture, in the New Testament in particular, all are called by God, but not all will respond in faith to be part of the elect in Christ Jesus. All are called by God, we read that through scripture, but not all will respond to that call in faith to be part of the elect in Christ Jesus. All Israel had special privileges that made a real relationship with the living God attainable. Yet time and again, the nation at large rejected him, while a small remnant only would prove to be faithful. This is like the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Wide is the way that leads to destruction, Jesus said. Many there be that find it. Narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. Few there be that find it. All have been given the opportunity for faith in the Lord Jesus. Romans 1.20 says, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It wouldn't make sense to say someone is without excuse if they had no will nor choice in the matter. 
To make his point even more clear, I think Paul moves on now um, from Isaac versus Ishmael to Jacob versus Esau. Some Jews at this point could be like, well, Isaac is my father. I'm not an Arab. I'm a Jew. Why would I be claiming Abraham as my father through Ishmael? Paul moves on to Isaac's twin sons now, of whom Esau was the firstborn and should have received the birthright according to the to precedent, but he did not. And so here in verse 10 to 13, I've titled this section, <clears throat> God had been faithful to Israel as evidenced by Jacob and Esau. And so verse 10 to 13, God has been faithful to Israel as evidenced by Jacob and Esau. Verse 10, not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not by works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So now we have the same father, the same mother, the same moment of conception, so different from Isaac and Ishmael, but the election of one child over the other and the younger at that, the younger versus the firstborn. This is clearly pointing to God's sovereignty and his prerogative to choose. I have no problem saying that this is pointing to God's election and that he has the, the prerogative to elect whom he will. I just don't see that salvation is in view here, uh, that this is indicating there are other verses that I think are challenging and you have to think about the whole of scripture to understand them, but in this passage, I do not see salvation being in view here. Nowhere in our passage do we see eternal life or salvation being the end that he's, it, that he's stating to the Jews that all this is pointing to or that we're talking about. Rather, we see election as related to the means God is using to carry out his purposes. <clears throat> and I don't want to just make that claim and move on. So um, a couple points on that. So this chapter opens and closes with the nation of Israel in view. In the opening, they are, Paul refers to them as his brethren, and then he goes on to define that as his countrymen. Um, verse 4, referring to Israelites at large. And then at the close of this chapter, end of chapter 9, verse 31, uh, we again see both Gentiles in the plural and um, Israel at large is mentioned. So I think the context is the that he is addressing is the nation of Israel. And in chapter 10, verse 1, we read, Brethren, my heart's desire, present tense, and prayer to God for them, Israel, is that they may be saved. Paul is speaking generally, speaking of the nation of Israel at large. He is not saying, I strongly desire for all of them to be saved, but I'm pretty bummed that only some of them were chosen by the Lord, and that's why I'm struggling. Like, there's, um, in fact, only a small few are saved. I don't see that that's his tone or what he is saying here. Nor is Paul saying, good news. If you have Jacob in your lineage, you are saved, for that also isn't the case. Um, further, he isn't saying, if you have an Edomite, one of Esau's offspring in your church, give him the boot. He's a fraud. He's not part of the elect. He's not saying um, that these are election for salvation. Rather, you see him taking three chapters length in his letter to plead with his countrymen. Israel at large to understand and agree that the gospel is the fulfillment, not the replacement of God's promises to Israel. Why would you plead with people or for people who have been sovereignly blinded to the gospel and destined for hell? So that's my first 
I guess, argument for the, who the elect is here. And then second, uh, let's consider Jacob and Esau. Paul is quoting scripture, two different passages in what he says here. One from the actual account in Genesis of Jacob and Esau's life, and the other, fast forward all the way to the end of the Old Testament. The book of Malachi is where the second quote is from. And so two bookends, so to speak. The bookend, the front, and then the end of the Old Testament. And so let's look at the first quote, which is from the beginning. Genesis 25, verse 23. <clears throat> this is what the Lord said exactly to Rebekah. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. That's it. That's all the Lord says to her. He doesn't say the older is banished to Sheol. The older is to be in slavery to the younger like Israel was to Egypt. Simply the older shall serve the younger. More context of what that entails is provided two chapters later. In, verse, in chapter 27, when Isaac is giving the blessings to Jacob, listen to what his blessing is. To the Jacob, the younger son who was elected by God, the one who we read, I have loved Jacob, hated Esau. This is Isaac's blessing to him. Let people serve you, nations bow down to you, be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons, a.k.a. Esau, your brethren, bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Likewise, in verse 40, when Isaac is giving Esau a blessing, he simply references this aspect by saying, you shall serve your brother. That's all. This was not in a hard labor sense, like the, the Israelites in Egypt where they're getting whipped and they got to make the bricks faster. This isn't even that sense. Um, I don't even see anywhere Jacob um, was actually physically served by his brother Esau. I, um, I don't see that anywhere spelled out where Esau was working for his brother. Um, in fact, in chapter 36, verse 7, we read that Jacob and Esau had to part ways because the land couldn't sustain both of their sets of cattle. And so um, they both were prosperous men, it would appear. And, um, and so they had to separate. And so the second Old Testament quote, so that's the first one. My point there is that we, we don't see God's intent for Esau like a life of misery. It was simply your brother, your, old, your younger brother is going to be your Lord or is going to be um, your master. And then you get over to um, the other quote mentioned, which is this more challenging one of Esau or Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And that's a quote from Malachi chapter 1. And We'll just read this section because I think it really, um, as we conclude here, it really points to the heart of God and the heart of what Paul is getting to. Malachi 1, verse 1 to 5, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. or It's, um, it's also one of my most troubling, the one that troubles me a lot. But the Lord says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? So Malachi is a prophet, the last prophet to Israel, and he's addressing Israelites, and, and he's giving them a message where the message is God saying to Israel, I have loved you. But their response was, how have you loved me? <coughs> but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, answers the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, Edom being Esau's tribe, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down and they will be called the wicked country, 
and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. So think about this. Malachi was written some 1,600 years later in Israel's history from Genesis, from that first quote. 1,600 years. And so God, when God is addressing Israel and Malachi, he is warning them once again for the billionth time, come back to me, turn back to me. This had been the recurring theme over that 1,600-year span. And yet, as we're reminded by our brother Scott Dunkerton recently, two weeks ago, God is just so merciful. He is so good and loving, so patient. And so we find him pleading with Israel to turn back. In the opening verses, we see the Lord makes a reasonable claim. I have loved you. And yet it's followed by this hard, I can only picture this as just a bitter-hearted response from Israel. How have you loved us? You know, think about the Lord's response to that question. Here's a group of people struggling. They're discouraged people in Malachi's day. They are not confident in their God at this point. They are not confident in who they are as a people. They are very discouraged in terms of their relationship with God. And, and so they pose this question, how have you loved us? And the Lord says, I have loved Jacob and I have hated Esau. What do these mean? If he is talking about individuals, the individual man, Jacob, the individual man, Esau, Why would he say that to them? Why, um, how is that any explanation for how he has loved them? They didn't ask, how did you love our, our, like our ancestor? They asked, how have you loved us? So how does addressing Jacob and Esau answer their question? These people standing 1,600 years after Jacob and Esau. That's like saying, oh, I was good to your grandfather some 40 generations back. He was a really good guy. His name meant supplanter, um, kind of a weasel, but I was good to him. I loved him. That's not the point, is it? Like, that's not, God isn't saying, I was good to Jacob, and so that's how I've loved you 1,600 years later. That's, you should be really excited about that. No, he's talking about the tribe of Jacob and the lineage, the lineage of Jacob and the lineage of Esau. He is saying that 1,600 years, millennia, Generation, century after century, generation after generation, year after year, day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, I have been perfectly faithful to you. I have loved you. I have loved you completely. All the way back to the founder, the, the one who was renamed Israel and the nation born out of. It can't be referring to Jacob and Esau as individuals, but as lineages. He is showing them how he has been especially good to them. He has doted over them, protected them, faithful to them. Even though, yes, it has included times of discipline. That just shows all the more how he has been shepherding them faithfully, relentlessly. And by way of contrast and emphasis, he says, And Esau I have hated. In other words, I have hedged you, Jacob, about with protection. I have catered to, doted upon you. And your cousins over there in Edom, I have hated them in contrast. It looks like hatred in in comparison. I have kept them from competing with your lineage's blessings, despite their also being um, descendants of Abraham and Isaac. When they try to stand and rebuild, I just pull the rug out from under. They aren't going anywhere. You are going somewhere. I have prospered you while they have simply survived. In other words, as verse 5 alludes to, I have been great for you even beyond your borders and at Edom's expense. I don't see any other way than to see these verses as descriptive rather than prescriptive, as another brother mentioned it to me recently. He's not saying, I chose Jacob, and therefore I blessed him his whole life, or I I decided to hate Esau, 
And so that's what you see in Esau. I don't believe that's what he's saying. What he's showing is that I have blessed Jacob. I have faithfully, I have been faithful to your lineage. All the way to you, people in Malachi's day, all the way back to Jacob, I have loved you. He's speaking to the pattern since Jacob and the pattern since Esau. He's begging them to see his faithfulness. And likewise, in, in closing, Paul is begging Jews in his day to open their eyes to this same reality. And so that concludes our section today. Um, God has not forsaken Israel. We're going to continue dealing with Israel. Rather, he has given her a very important role that um, is not complete yet. Um, if anything, others could be jealous when they look at Israel. And they say, well, why did you get the prophets and, and this or that? But it was God's response is, as we'll see next week, I will be merciful to whom I will show mercy. God is perfectly just to choose some instruments for honor and some for dishonor. But we have to be cautious reading salvation into that. Um, and so the question facing Jews in Paul's day is the same question facing you. Um, it's whether you are part of the elect in Christ Jesus. Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, God's chosen Messiah, the Savior of the world? Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you um, for your word. And Lord, we just pray that as we go home today, it would not be my thoughts or my words that go home with us. Lord, we pray that you would only keep those things in mind, which is true and which is of you. Lord, we pray that you would um, help us to understand um, that you do not change and your promises we can count on. Israel can still count on them even if they have rejected you. We see in the New Testament, you may be faithless and yet I, the Lord, remain faithful. Father, we give you thanks for your incredible love, your incredible relentless pursuit shown in Israel and each of us likely able to give testif testament to that as well in our own lives, how you have relentlessly pursued us. We give you thanks in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.